to give it up for the worship team one time this morning. Good stuff. Good to see y'all this morning. How many of you glad it's Sunday? Say amen. amen. How many of you know you got stuff to do today because it's pretty outside? Amen. Man, is it nice out. I, somebody said there are going to be a lot of people at church and then there are going to be a lot of people fishing. And uh, either one I'm okay with. Uh, just make sure you stop by at some point and see us. But we're so glad that you're here this morning. So excited you decided to come out. Hey, how many of you were here last week at Easter in the 10 o'clock service? Yeah. <laughs> that, that was nuts, huh? Uh, I want to say thanks to our team, our volunteers, to everybody, for all of you being so patient. And our first service last week at our 8.30, which was our mask service, we, we had about 180 people in that service, which was a great Sunday for us. Um, in that 8 o'clock service or that 8.30 service. Uh, I think last week in the 10 o'clock service, we had something like 560 people in this room. And, um, and say a special pair of thanks to the children's volunteers. In the 10 o'clock service last week, we had 170 kids. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, but last week, over both locations, we saw over 1,500 people come back to the house to worship Jesus Christ. And so we're super excited about people just taking the step. And I know for a lot of you, maybe Easter was that, that tipping point where you said, you know, we just got to get back. We just got to get back to the house and be with, with church again or in church again. And for that, I say as your pastor, thank you. I also say thanks for sticking with us through that season. I don't, I don't know what we call that, like, I, I don't, pandemic seems overused. I don't want to use that. Marvel called it the blip, and I don't know if we want to use that in, for last year, but um, I, I know that I'm glad we're getting to the place where people are, are, are feeling a little more comfortable moving around and getting back into the house where, where we can be together. So excited about that. We're starting a brand new series uh, this morning called The Ghost. All right, now, I don't know if you've grown up, how many of you, just by show of hands, how many of you have grown up in church, show of hands? Hands way up, put them up, put them up, put them up. All right, good, 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 good. So now, I'm going to ask this question because I'm going to, I'm going to read through the scripture and then we're going to get back, I'm going to get back to my question. So last week we ended in John chapter 20, where I told you the story, I said on that day, the first day of the week, the disciples were locked in the room for fear of the Jews. And Jesus appeared to them in the room saying, peace be unto you. And as he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and they were glad that Jesus had arrived on the scene. And so we know that from last week. We know that Jesus shows up. He's about to give them the story. Now, what I didn't do for you last week is tell you what Jesus was setting them up for. The reason Jesus showed up in a locked room with these people wasn't just to set them free from the locked room, but was to give them purpose so that when they were set free from the locked room, they would have something to do. And so we pick it up in verse 21 of John chapter 20 this week, and it says this, And Jesus said to them again, Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, even so, I'm sending you. So Jesus says, hey, here, I'm giving you a purpose. I, I, I want you to know that the resurrection was real, that, that this is a real thing, that this ministry that we had was a real thing, but now... I'm sending you. Just as God sent me here to start it off, I'm sending you now to go continue the work. And so there's a sending that takes place, but you can't stop at verse 21 because it continues into verse 22. And it says, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to link those two passages together because I think it's critical that you and I understand that if God ever sends you to do a job, you cannot do it without the Holy Spirit of God in your life. Amen. You, you cannot do it without the Spirit of God functioning in you. Now, as we get into this series, this is, we're going we're gonna talk, to talk church background a little bit here. So depending on your church background, you either call him the Holy Spirit, you called him the dove. Depending on your church background, you might have called him the Holy Ghost. So how many of you have a... Baptist-ish background. Hands up, way up, put them up. It's okay. All the Baptists are like, we're not used to raising our hands. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Hold on, I'll prove my point in just a second. So again, Baptist-ish, hands up in the house. Put them up. All right, sweet. All right, hands down. How many of you come from a Pentecostal slash charismatic background? See, there's always one. They can't help it. They can't. They can't help it. 
hands were like this and somebody had to woo. They can't help themselves. So, so again, Pentecostal, charismatic, hands up, back. go ahead, put them way up, put them way up, it's okay. No, no, sit down. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is the thing. I grew, up, I grew up somewhere, thank God, in the middle. Okay, and I say thank God for a reason, because sometimes in our, in our Baptist history, we have this real issue with the Holy Spirit, because when the Holy Spirit shows up, stuff gets weird. Okay, and I'm just speaking honest with you. For those of you that are Pentecostal and charismatic background, you're like, that's not weird, that's Sunday. <laughs> I'm talking to my Baptist folks for just a second, so let me, let me counsel them through this moment. Because that was me. I grew up in a church that wasn't really hand-raising, wasn't really that kind of thing, really wasn't a lot of freedom uh, in regards to the Holy Spirit. And so I grew up kind of on one end of the pendulum swing where the Holy Spirit, even though we knew He was part of the Trinity, there was Father, Son, and, and the Holy Ghost, but we kind of were like it was Father and Son, and there's the Holy Ghost. And we didn't really, really, we knew He was there, but he was, it's kind of like that uncle you got that you know you got Him, but you're not going to talk about Him. That was the Holy Spirit because we, we weren't sure what was going to happen with the Holy Spirit. Now, we would give it moments. We'd give it moments like, man, that was a service. Woo! That was a good service. Spirit showed up in that one. And what that means is that we had a moment where we felt something. And that's how we described it. And so you had that end of the pendulum. And then you swung to the other side. With the Pentecostals and the Charismatic, it wasn't church unless something happened with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost or if there wasn't an act or a, a movement or something to that extent where we almost didn't talk about God Almighty as much as we talked about the Holy Spirit. We, we almost didn't talk about the Lamb as much as we talked about the Dove. And the pendulum swings to either side, and what it creates is confusion in the church. It creates this place where we're not sure if we're supposed to talk about it or not supposed to talk about it. I'm just going to tell you straight up. I, I'm going to talk about it because here's what I'm finding out about the Holy Spirit. I've been pastoring for 20 years, and I haven't even scratched the surface of all that He is able to do in my life. And so anything that I say will not be discounting one thing or the other because what I'm finding out is that sometimes God can do things that I do not expect. Amen. And most of the time, those are the things that I really enjoy when God shows up in a way I don't expect. And so as we talk through the differences this, over the next several weeks of this, this idea of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, they're the same person. All right? The Holy Spirit is, is, is not a feeling. It's, it's a person. It's a person in the Trinity. He's equal with God the Father. He's equal with Jesus the Son. He is equal with those three. And we've just got to figure out how to bring Him to the middle to where we understand that in our lives as believers, we can't do anything without Him. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. And so I want to talk about it today and then it's going to kind of set up the next several weeks uh, of this series. So today, I, I want to first encourage you to let you know that depending on where you're at, how many of you, let's, can we just be honest, everybody okay, just look at the person next to you and go, I love you, but. <laughs> okay, so now it's out there. So anything that happens now, you've already laid the foundation of I love you, all right? <laughs> how many of you have ever been in a service where the spirit breaks out and you've been a little confused. Okay? How many of you have ever been in a service where the spirit breaks out and you're not a little confused, you are terrified? Okay? My first experience with this was I was about six and my family roots are from the hollers, holler, that's with an R. Not in the actual spelling of the word, but how you say the word. Some of you understand, right? From the hollers of Kentucky. And that's where my mom's bunch is from. And so uh, my aunt attended a very charismatic, borderline snake handling church. 
there's a biblical reference for snake handling. It's just sometimes twisted. Okay? But we went on a Sunday night. Now, I'm just going to tell you, if those of you that are Pentecostal charismatic people, you understand, Sunday night, <laughs> Sunday night's where I'm going to get loose. Woo! It's going to happen on Sunday night because all the new people don't come on Sunday night. <laughs> Pentecostals in the house. Am I lying? No. Thank you. All right. Baptists did it too. We were just a little more reserved on Sunday nights. We'd, we'd sing I'll Fly Away three times, call it good. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, he's right, he's right. <laughs> but we went to this service, man, and we're at dinner, and I'm having church, and I'm like six, seven years old. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there with my hands on the pew, white-knuckling that sucker. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. My mom's like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I'm like, I don't think it's okay. <laughs> I don't think she should be doing that. She doesn't look fit enough to do that. <laughs> and there's a lady, she's just trucking, man. She is moving. <laughs> just doing laps around the church I didn't understand it then my aunt took off like took off she hit the aisle did two cartwheels on the way to the altar as God is my wit as God is my wit is that what happened some of y'all think it's funny you weren't there listen I was scared I left that night I left that night and I thought that's crazy Fast forward several years, I had an experience. I, some of you remember back in the 90s, there was what they called the Toronto Blessing. Um, Baptists won't know about this because we didn't talk about things like that. But some of the Pentecostals, Charismatics will know what I'm talking about. Toronto Blessing that took off. There's something like, there's like 370 consecutive nights of church and salvations. This thing just took off off. Went on thousands showing up. You thought last Sunday was crazy? People parking miles away and being bussed into the, the church where this was happening. They ended up moving in it to a, um, an arena because people just kept showing up for it. It's crazy and I had the opportunity to go. And I went in there and I experienced that, that moment of just this freedom in God to be able to go, Lord, whatever it is you want to tell me, whatever, however it is you want to lead me, I'm open to it, God. And I sat there and, and I watched people being prayed over. And, and the pastor, he got to the end of the service and they had us line up against the walls, man. And the pastor started walking around. And the pastor sat there and he get this. He went like that. Boom, fell down. Boom, fell down. Went down. Just, and I'm, I'm, I'm in line. I'm like, yes, come on. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little skeptical. I'm a little skeptical. But I'm here. I'm here. I'm going to see. I'm going to see what's about. I'm here. I'm here. And he gets up to me and literally, literally, I look like a wide receiver getting ready to take off. Because I was like this. I'm like, come on. Come on. And I'm leaning in and the pastor walks right up to me like this and he goes, no. And he moves right past me. <laughs> it's okay. I'm over it. I'm over it. It was such a good thing for me to experience because there was enough discernment in him to know that I wasn't seeking the Spirit of God. I was seeking a moment. And it made me understand that the moments aren't what make the Spirit of God. These, the acts, the, the different things. No, no, no. He's so much more than that. It's not an emotional thing. We'll see that here in just a second as we get into the Scripture. But I, I need to just tell you, as we go over this the next several weeks, because listen, I've been in those services, and I've been in services that I thought, man... What this service needs is somebody to just get loose right now and shout. And just come unglued and go, thank you, Jesus. Some of y'all have heard the story about when I announced my call to preach. Or that little preacher walking around the church on that Jericho march, preaching his face off, man. Sweating, slinging his Bible. Gets right up to my pew and stops. Stops his entire sermon. Looks right at me. Has never met me before in his life. And says, son, why aren't you preaching? And steps right back into his sermon like he didn't say nothing. And God crushed me in that moment because the Spirit, there's no other explanation than the Spirit of God going, Vince, you're not listening. I'm going to have to get your attention. And this preacher that I didn't know on a service on a Tuesday night, when normal people don't go to church, I was on Tuesday night, and God showed up in my life because he needed the Spirit to move. He is able 
And so I pray over the next several weeks, if nothing else, it makes you open to what the Spirit would like to do in your life. So I want to just give you some background real quick on how often the Spirit shows up in the church. But I want to give you this phrase. The Holy Spirit is the empowering presence of God for the mission of God, both to us and through us. It's the empowering presence of God. You have to have the Spirit of God to do the things of God. You can do things that are good, but you cannot do things that are God without the Spirit of God leading you and having you do them. And so it's that empowering presence of God that enables us to do the mission of God. We're going to find out here in a little bit why so many Christians have been Christians for years and they're still going, I just don't know what God wants me to do. I just don't know what God wants me to do. What's God's call on your life? I have no idea. Are you a Christian? Yes. What's your purpose? I don't know. I'm going to tell you right now so you can be pondering on it. That's a spirit issue. It's a Holy Spirit issue. It's not a salvation issue. It's a Holy Spirit issue. And so as we get into this, I want you to recognize that the Holy Spirit just didn't show up in Acts chapter 2 when there was this mighty rushing wind and and tongues of fire dropping and everybody and Peter preaching and people hearing in their own language and and all this that happened. That wasn't when he showed up. you got to go way back. Genesis chapter 1. Let's look at this. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. At creation, at the moment life began to happen, the moment that life began to show itself is when the Spirit of God, He's there. He's in the beginning of it. He's part of the creation process is in this. And so make sure you don't think that this was just something that Jesus threw out at us once He left. This has been in all the time, all present piece of the Godhead is the Holy Spirit. We see him at creation. He moves from there to another place. And I love seeing this because it's, it throws so many people. The first person that ever had the Spirit of God come upon them, his name was Bezalel. And Bezalel was an artist. But here's what the Bible says in Exodus. It says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability, intelligence, knowledge, and all craftsmanship. Man, this passage was freeing to me because I know there are a lot of people that sit in church and I grew up in church and I thought if I didn't preach, if I didn't teach Sunday school, if I didn't sing or if I didn't go move to Africa to be a missionary, I wasn't sure what I could do for God. But this passage, the very first person who it shares with us in Scripture that the Spirit of God moved upon was a general contractor. I know some of you are like, wait, construction people get Jesus too? This one did. Yeah, he for sure did. In fact, the Bible says that the Spirit gave him wisdom and knowledge, gave him discernment, and gave him the ability in all types of craftsmanship. This was the guy that was building the temple where the presence of God would reside. And so I want to just encourage some of you here today that have going, you know, I, I think I love this church thing and I love it, Jesus, but sometimes I just don't feel like I got it like somebody else has got it. If you are managing a successful business, if you are leading people, if you are doing something that's created or craftsmanlike, and you are doing that to give glory to God, it is the Spirit of God that has given you the ability to do that. Amen. That works in you and through you. And so often we say, well, no, 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 no. It's got to be this emotional experience. It is not an emotional experience. It is a presence experience. When the Spirit of God shows up in your life, He's not just seeking for an emotional response. He's seeking obedience just as God the Father would be or Jesus Christ would be. He just wants you to be obedient. If he tells you how to design the temple, then you design the temple that way. If he tells you that you need this wisdom to give the right answer, then you use that wisdom or that discernment to give the right answer. This knowledge that you've been blessed with, that's where it comes from is the Spirit of God. And so you lean into that. Next we see this happen in the book of Judges. This is one of my favorites here. Uh, Anybody lift weights in the house this morning? Weightlifters in the house, put them up. Hello, football team. I figured I'd have an overwhelming response in this corner right over here. Mountain Home Bombers in the corner with their hands up. 
A lot of them lifting weights. That's awesome. Here we got Samson. And when the spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson and the ropes that were on his arm became like flax that were caught on fire and his bonds melted off his hands. Then he finds a fresh jawbone of a donkey, picks it up and whoops a thousand Philistines. I love Samson. But how many, uh, serious, I get like amped talking about Samson. But how many of you grew up with coloring book Samson? You know, like every Samson pictures him like rolling in like this with the leather bracelets and the loincloth and he's jacked, right? Even coloring book Samson's got pecs. I'm about to mess up your world. Nowhere, nowhere in scripture do we get a description of Samson's physique. (laughs) What if Samson looked like me? (laughs) Hey, <laughs> all the dad bods in the house are like, yeah, preach, Pastor Vince. He probably didn't. He ate better. Um, they didn't have McDonald's back in the day. <laughs> but it never says he was, he was muscular. In fact, if you think about it, if God was going to get the glory for everything that Samson did miraculously, it doesn't make sense that he uses the person that looks the part to do it. It doesn't make sense. Like, literally, we see this picture in our mind of Conan and all these muscular guys. You send Schwarzenegger out with a jawbone, and guess what? Some of you are like, I've seen him do it to predators. He can do it to Philistines. I get it. But if you send Napoleon Dynamite out with a jawbone, you're like, This is not going to go well. It's not going to go well. But the reality is, when the Spirit rushed upon him, something shifted. Something happened. Something supernatural happened, not because of Samson, but because of the power in Samson from God. And we see that this moment allowed him to go do something radical, something amazing because of the spirit of God in his life. I wonder in your life, if you've been thinking that you don't have everything that makes sense to make something happen in your life. I don't, I don't, I don't speak, so I don't. Moses said he couldn't talk. He said God, he told God to, he was talking to a burning bush and said, I can't talk. Think about that. He's talking to a thing that doesn't talk normally. And tells it he can't talk. And God says, it's all right. You can send, we'll send your brother with you and he can do all the talking. And then if you study it out, Aaron doesn't do any talking. And when Aaron does talk, everything gets messed up. <laughs> but Moses stands up in boldness. Why? Because the spirit of God comes upon him. Samson stands up in boldness. Does he get it right all the time? No, this dude messes it up big time. But it doesn't change the fact the Spirit of God came upon him and when that happened, something amazing happened. I want to challenge you that some of the things, some of the reasons you keep hitting walls are not because you can't accomplish it, it's because you're trying to accomplish it and not allowing the Spirit of God to accomplish it in you. You're not allowing God to really dive in and do something amazing in you because, well, I just don't know that I can. You never could. I know, I should write an inspirational book, right? For without Christ, we are nothing. But with the Spirit of God, all things are possible through Christ Jesus. We know that word, but so often we stop as believers. i got to hurry. I'm not even halfway through. All right. So judges, that happens in Samson. We move on to Samuel where David, Samuel is the prophet at the time. And he anoints. He pours out this horn of oil. In the Old Testament, anytime you see the horn of oil, it is symbolic of the Spirit of God. Just like we use baptism as a symbol of the death, burial, and then resurrection of Jesus Christ, the oil is used as a symbol of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Samuel anoints David. And the Bible says that the Spirit rushed upon David. From that day forth, Forward and gave him the ability to lead, gave him the ability to fight and to be bold and to have trust in God. You know what David did immediately following getting anointed by the Holy Spirit? He went back to the sheep. And so let me encourage some of you right now. For some of you, God has anointed you to do great things. He just hasn't appointed them to happen yet. Don't give up. 
You hang in there. You keep walking right. You keep walking straight. You keep your head up. You keep your shoulders back. You stay bold for Jesus because the anointing is on you. The appointing just hasn't happened yet. It would be years, years later before David actually got to sit in the throne as the king of a unified Israel. It would be years before that would happen. The appointment, the anointing is where the power dropped. And you need this in your life. We see that happen in David's life. But then something interesting happens. From David's story and the kings, we see the Spirit of God move in them. And then we get into the New Testament. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Mary and she was with child. And Jesus is born. It's interesting to me that we don't see or hear about many miracles in the first 30 years of Jesus' life. I mean, we get the temple story when he's 12. And he escapes from mom and dad. And he hangs back in Jerusalem at the temple. And he ends up teaching for three days there in the temple. But in all honesty, Jesus was a Jewish boy. So he would have been in the scriptures every day. And so it wouldn't have been foreign for him to be able to sit and have a conversation about what the scriptures said at 12 years old. Because it had been his entire life. But that's really the only story we get. I know most of us would love stories. We're like, you know, we want to see Jesus like walking on the bathwater kind of thing, right? We want that kind of moment, man, that would be cool. What was Jesus like when he was a kid? I think he was a kid. Because then when Jesus' ministry started, when the mission of God started in Jesus' life, something really critical happens at his baptism. The Bible says that the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then the miracles occurred. Do you know why? Because you cannot accomplish the mission of God without the Spirit of God in your life. And Jesus wouldn't give us a story that contradicted the one he lived out. He wouldn't do that. And so we see the Spirit of God working through Jesus' life with miracles happening, with, with all this different stuff occurring. And Jesus, then the story began to grow and people begin to hear in other communities about this guy that's doing crazy stuff. Man, it's some wild things happening when Jesus shows up. They weren't telling those stories when he was 15, 16, 20. No. Because the Spirit had finally arrived, and now the mission was at hand. From there, we see Jesus go into this wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights in a fast. And he's tempted by Satan, and when he shows up, when it's over, Luke chapter 4 tells us this, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he taught in the synagogues, being glorified by all. The Holy Spirit empowers the work of God. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, But you will be given power when the Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Timothy talks about it this way. He says, All Scripture is breathed. The Old Testament word for spirit is ruach. It's breath of wind of God. And this passage from Timothy is a call back to that. He said the whole scripture, all of the word of God is spirit inspired. It is breathed by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and all these things. The spirit of God is infallible. It's inerrant. There are no errors. There is nothing false in the word of God because... It was God that inspired writing it. So we know this spirit shows up from the very beginning to now. And if we know the spirit is the empowering presence of God in order to do the mission of God, both to you and through you, then what are we missing? It's the two first things. The two words I want to lean into are empowering and presence. Empowering in this way in that you and I, we have some abilities. God gave us this gray matter between our ears that enables us to think strategically, to make good decisions. How many of you have made good decisions in your life? Say amen. <laughs> like four of you. <laughs> I'm not raising my hand. This is a trick question. How many of you have made bad decisions in your life? Yeah. We have the ability to do both because God gave us this will and he gave us this ability to think. But he also gave us access. This access to an empowering, to a, 
to a, a source of strength. Not all the time is it physical like Samson. Not all the time is it intellectual like it was for the craftsmen in the Old Testament. But all the time, it's exactly what's needed when we trust it. When we trust it. I wasn't planning on doing it, but you just keep doing what you're doing there. Um, Dallas has a musical gift. And I love him, hate him for it. I love him for it because it's moments like these where he knows exactly kind of how to come in, what the feel of the room is like. But right now, Dallas is playing absolutely nothing. Nothing. What I mean is, now it's something, but it's nothing. He doesn't even know what he's going to play next. He's just, this is awesome. <laughs> if I sat down at that piano, do you know what kind of blessing I would be to you guys? <laughs> Y'all would want to get an exorcist in here. It'd be bad. I don't have that ability. It's not my gift. It's not how I do it. But you see, I, I function in a different gift. The Spirit has empowered me to do something different. Because if we were to trade spots right now, it would be an equal train wreck. Me trying to play something and him trying to speak to you consistently for 40 minutes. Can I get an amen? It's not because he's not able. We could both work on it and probably get there. But as far as living in the freedom of the Spirit moving in our lives, we both know what we do well. It doesn't mean I'm not nervous about it. It doesn't mean I'm not praying, God, I need you to show up. I stand back here in this hallway and I pace. I'm back and forth between my office and this door. And I peek out the door. And I'm making sure y'all are worshiping. Because if you're not worshiping, I'm like, oh, God, they're not ready. They're not ready. They don't want to hear it this morning. Look at how unhappy some of them look. <laughs> y'all singing Waymaker like this. Waymaker. Mirror. That's hard to preach to. I come out and I'm like, Jesus, I need your help. But then the moment I step into it, I could do this for another two hours and never slow down. I won't. <laughs> but it's being in, in this gifting, in this calling, in this trusting the Spirit. So many times people, they believe in Jesus Christ. They believe that He has, we've got, uh, and the only illustration I can give you for this is that at this moment of salvation, God parked a Ferrari in your garage and you look at it. But I'm, man, I know it's fast. How do you know it's fast? And I've seen, I've seen, whoo, I've seen what some people can do in it. Wait, isn't that your car? Yeah. Why don't we get it out? Whoa. <laughs> could get a little crazy if I get it out and drive it. If I actually hit the gas pedal in that thing, it could get sideways. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Sometimes, some of you right now with the Spirit of God, you're afraid to get it out and let Him drive because it might get a little sideways and you don't know what to do with that. Some of you right now, you've been saved. You've said yes to Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secure. Your heavenly home is locked in and you're good to go. But you don't have any purpose and you don't have any direction and you don't know what the call of God is in your life because you have yet to tap into what the Spirit of God has gifted you with. To know. We do Life Connect here at the church. And one of the things we do at Life Connect is we go, hey, what's your spiritual gift? You would be amazed at the people that come in that have known Jesus for five years, 10 years, 40 years. And have no idea what their gift is. How God, at that moment of salvation, endowed them with a spiritual gift. Just like he came upon David, just like he came upon Samson, just like he came upon people throughout Scripture, he came upon you. What stories can you write about? What stories can you write about about living in the Spirit of God, moving under the power of the Holy Spirit? I had to ask myself that question and I got real convicted by God. And I said, Lord, I want to be empowered by your spirit. I don't only want to preach with power and authority and trust God. I want to live like that. I, I, want, I want people to know when I walk by, something's up. God, make me that person. I know it's going to rattle a few people. It's probably going to rattle me in some moments. There have been moments where God's just kind of nudged and said, hey, you need to talk to that person. I don't want to talk to that person. God, I didn't ask you if you wanted to. I said you need to. Oh, 
okay, let's go. Let's see, let's see what it is. And you step into it, and it's amazing what happens. The stories that get told in the Word of God are stories of people living out an empowered mission of God. What stories you got? It's a simple question to ask. What stories could I tell? If I were going to lead somebody to Christ and they said, well, tell me what Jesus has done through you. What answer would you give them? Now, what has Jesus done in you? That's presence. That's a great thing, man. That's comfort. That's peace. That's joy. That's the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, what God produces in your life. Those are great things. And we need them at every... But this empowering is so that we can do. What has He done through you? 